I'm very pleased to have an avid record collector without an M to my left. He's one half of the dreamy pop, whatever you want to call it, project Quiet Village. Um, one of the worldwide experts for library music. And, <laughs> <laughs> and yes, please give him a very warm welcome, Joel Martin from London. Thank you. So Joel, before we start to talk about what library music actually is and if it's played in libraries or wherever, um, tell us a little bit about your yeah, musical diet. like uh, At the moment or growing up? Growing up. Um, uh, I, I suppose I was quite um, privileged to come from a household that was kind of um, uh, musically rich. My, you know, I, my parents you know, um, uh, played a lot of music when we were driving in the car and I was just exposed to just music constantly, really. Uh, you know, uh, we were always, always listening to the uh, charts. Uh, so I heard, you know, back in the 70s, uh, there was such a great cross-section of pop music, reggae music, punk, uh, you know, electronic, and it was all kind of, you know, uh, presented to you every week. It wasn't like now where it was manufactured pop groups. It was just great music was a great pop song. So I, I was exposed to all these, all these genres kind of without realizing it. And, but obviously quite early on, probably due again to my parents' taste, it affected the way that I listened to music. So I was very into harmony. I was, you know, I was really into the Beach Boys and I was very into David Bowie and, and things like that and Electric Light Orchestra, purely because that was what I was kind of played. But, you know, uh, I, I kind of, I mean, my mum told me that she took me to see the ABBA movie when I was probably like two years old. And I think I, she had to go and grab me from the aisle. I was like running and dancing and singing in the aisle. So uh, I, music played a big part in my life from kind of day one, really. So did you go and watch the remake of the ABBA movie as well? Uh, funny enough, no. But uh, I, I wouldn't be quick to kind of say bad things about it. I, I, I was watching the culture show and uh, one of the critics that I particularly like, Mark Camoe, basically said he found it very difficult to criticize the film because it was just so saccharine and so schmaltzy and lovely, but it was absolutely difficult. You know, you, you, you couldn't help but be swept up by it. But then again, I, I didn't go and see it. So uh, yeah, okay. not my type of thing. <laughs> And um, yeah, you, you were not only listening to music, but also learning an instrument, right? Um, yeah, probably, you know, I, I went to a um, private school, which in England, we had this discussion earlier. Um, public school and a private school is the same thing in England. And kind of once you get to a certain age, um, it's kind of pretty standard for um, uh, your parents to be sent a letter uh, saying, you know, we feel that your child should learn a musical instrument. You know, what would you like to learn? You got the piano, you got the guitar, the drums, whatever. Normally it's something like the violin. And so I chose the violin. I didn't particularly want to learn the violin, but it was kind of, you know, the done thing, I suppose. And so I learned the violin for maybe five or six years, and I think I got up to grade three. I, 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 I forget how many grades there are, but um, I did pretty well. But I always remember that my violin uh, teacher um, used to get very, very angry with me. I mean, very, very angry with me, because instead of reading music, I was quite lazy, so I didn't read the music. I used to um, follow the music by ear, and I would remember what she played before me, and I'd just copy it. And she could see that I wasn't reading the music, and uh, she used to kind of, you know, give me a clip around the ear. And um, yeah, I, I kind of didn't particularly like practicing. So um, once I, you know, turned like 15, and you know, you start going out with kind of friends and stuff, I, I, I kind of the violin went down the uh, toilet, as they say. I think I, you know, sold it. <laughs> um, so you don't play the violin today? No, I don't. No. We we had a keyboard. We had like a family keyboard. As th that was also a trend during the 80s. And uh, again, I would play along with records that I liked and just remember riffs and stuff. I can't play classically, but um, you know, I could remember a riff and kind of reinterpret it um, quite, quite quickly. So um, 
Yeah. And you mentioned going out. You you grew up in London, right? So I was I was born in um, in, in the centre of London in I don't know if it's the centre. Well, it's centre, Ham, Hammersmith, but I was brought up in Kent uh, up until you know kind of most of my life, and that's where I went to school. But I spent a lot of time, especially at weekends in. Um, the you know West End of London. I was always going to mu museums and restaurants and, and kind of that type of thing and concerts and stuff. So I was always in town. And when I got older, I spent all my time in town. Once I discovered record shops and clubs and things and clothes shops, and I was I didn't want to you know I wanted to get as far away from the suburbs as I could. And yeah, w what were the clubs you went to? I mean, would you say or would you argue that it was very important to what you're doing now? Like your, your um, club history, I I think so. Yeah, I mean, I I think obviously because I was very into music from an early age, and I was someone who chose my own music, whether or not I was influenced by older friends at a younger age, or because I heard it on the radio. Um, I used to go and pick my own music, whereas most of my friends at school would, you know, just listen to the latest chart music. Uh, once I got to a certain age, which, which was probably about 13, you know, uh, I kind of got out of the realms of pop music and I discovered hip-hop and that kind of became my obsession. And, uh, you know, um, I, I heard all these fantastic records on and I got into labels like Def Jam and things like that, which then kind of went totally overground and by then I wasn't so interested. And, and through that, I discovered record shops, kind of legendary record shops in London where I used to save up my uh, pocket money every month and you know maybe once or twice a year I'd go up to shops like Groove Records in London and you know uh, buy maybe two 12 inches in an, al in an album and other shops like Tower Records in, 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 in London which was a legendary shop because it used to have cutouts uh, you know and what, what are cutouts? Cutout, well we don't really have cutout culture anymore because it's become very collectible but basically shops like Virgin Megastore which kind of again sadly doesn't exist anymore and and tower records um they apart from selling brand new records uh there was this abundance of old stock from american warehouses and english warehouses sealed original records which now go for a lot of money so you know you you'd, you'd walk into the in, into the soul section and you'd find you know sealed copies of james brown records and if you looked a bit deeper and you knew a bit more you'd find records by groups like the Wild Magnolias or Mandrill or people like that who, you know, were the source of samples for hip-hop artists. And you'd walk up to the jazz section and you'd find these original records by people like Bob James. And, you know, I was kind of learning about these people through my love of hip-hop and buying records like The Ultimate Breaks and Beats, which were a pure history lesson for me. You know, I learned so much from those records. Th these were basically records designed for... Uh, producers, hip hop producers, and they were, th they kind of contained all the classic um, source, you know, break and beat sources from back in the old days, you know, and, you know, you'd have, uh, you know, funk tracks, you'd have movie soundtracks, you'd have heavy metal, you know, all on the same, jazz, you'd all on the same record. And I kind of, uh, you kind of didn't really understand it at the beginning, and then you kind of got where it was coming from. And eventually, instead of just listening to the one break on the track, you'd actually listen to the whole track and realize that the music was pretty good. So that was um, a kind of big thing for me. And then I, I used to go out and buy, I used to go to thrift stores or charity shops, as we call them in England, and look for any records that looked interesting. Uh, you know, and that's, you know. And it evolved into a real obsession. I, I mean, involved into, yeah. Maybe everyone in here would say he's obsessed with music, but like being a a real record collector? Maybe you can talk about this this <laughs> crazy world, Nick <laughs> Well, <Hornby. laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I suppose it's be become a cliche now about being a record collector or a record crate digger, which I really don't like that, that, that word at all. Um, Why? Well, generally there aren't crates, you know, but and it's just it's just a real invented, again, like the guy before was, was, was saying, he doesn't like, you know, the way that a, that a term or a genre is just invented, and it's kind of the way that that's happened with it. Um, you know, it's just a, a, a kind of term, a lazy way of saying someone that goes out and looks for records. You know, it's just bastardized being into music, I think. And the reason why I'm such an obsessive record collector is first and foremost because I love music and I 
find it very difficult to operate without having to go and discover new music on a daily basis. I literally, it's like the air that I breathe. It's, you know, unfortunate, I know, but yeah. I kind of crave looking for, looking for new, interesting music that I haven't heard before. Like I mentioned before, how, how can it be that a record collector like you doesn't have an amp at home? Um, because I spend more time looking for music than I do thinking about buying a hi-fi. And I, and I get by on CDs, making CDs occasionally, um, being given CDs, buying CDs, listening to the radio. And I always dream of this one day when I'm going to have this amazing hi-fi in, you know, in a warehouse space and I'll finally be able to listen to all, you know, I'll have all my records filed properly. Because uh, at the moment they're mostly in boxes <laughs> and I'll be able to enjoy it. You know, in my twilight years, <laughs> whatever. So you but have a house full of records, but are waiting to play them. Kind of, yeah. It's quite sad, really. And y yeah, you you mentioned hip hop being a big influence on you. You actually did a compilation with hip hop as well, right? A yeah. A few years ago. Yeah, in in 2001, um, I I did a compilation with my music partner Matt Edwards, who who also did a, a Red Bull Academy. Uh, with you. Yeah, he's, he's also known as Radio Slave. Yeah, he, he's the famous half. The other half. Yeah. And um, yeah, back in 2001, um, we'd, we'd, we'd wanted to start a record label for a long time. And uh, we got involved with a company back then called Beachwood. I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with, with a label called Master Cuts. Master Cuts released like the best of hip hop the best of jazz funk, and they made about 30 or 40 records, all compiled by one or two people. And they were like, pretty much, you know, a, a, the cream of every genre, you know, like a primer of, you know, if you don't know anything about, uh, you know, kind of, you know, jazz fusion, you go and buy a Master Cuts record and it would pretty much be all the best tracks. And we got involved with this label, we started our own label called Heroes and Villains, and we were gonna put out a whole series of compilations. And the first of which was, was done with uh, Matt and I conceived the project and uh, a very good friend of mine called Mark B uh, who's like a kind of underground London uh, hip-hop producer uh, who's also someone who inspired me very much when we used to go out looking for records um, he compiled an album pretty much th the first album of um, kind of disco rap I don't know if any of you are familiar with the rap that came before you know, the Beastie Boys and LL Cool J and Big Daddy Kane and all the other Jay-Z and everyone. But this is stuff that came out on very small labels back in the late 70s and early 80s. And it's very funky. It's kind of like disco, but with a rap. And that was a big influence on me, that music, when I heard that. Because I was a very big fan of disco. And we came up with the idea of putting a compilation together of this stuff because Mark had been on that for, for many years when no one cared. And it's since become this very, very collectible genre. The records can achieve like thousand, over a thousand dollar prices on eBay and people go crazy for it, but no one really, it was a forgotten genre. No one really cared about it at all. And we put this compilation together and the label basically screwed us. They didn't do any promotion. Uh, they didn't sell it into the shops correctly. And I found out that in the end, that they, didn't, they did the worst thing uh, totally, which was not releasing it on vinyl. So there was this CD that we spent a fortune making. We got a photographer from New York called, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, uh, called Jamal Shabazz. He's a guy that did a book called Back in the Day. We, he's the loveliest, one of the loveliest people I've ever met in my life. He, um, we, we met, I'm trying to remember how we actually met him. I think we saw some of his photos. We read about an exhibition of his in New York. We read, him, read about him in a magazine. And uh, we asked him if he'd be interested in doing the artwork for our album because he was about to release this book and he'd never done a show outside of America before and we invited him to come and do a show at a gallery in London run by the magazine Dazed and Confused um, and um, yeah he came over it was fantastic we had a great launch party we had a CD that came out on the record you know, on, the, on the magazine he had a show we went to do another show with him in uh, Hollywood and you know just hanging out with him was worthwhile for the whole project but unfortunately the album completely sunk into obscurity and you know it, they ended up in like a one of those cheap three pound cd stores in 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 london like a bulk load of them like the last thousand and it was very expensive to make and i think i have one copy of it 
What a tragedy. Yeah. But um, maybe we can listen to one of the tracks from that compilation. Yeah. Uh, just to give you an idea of what disco rap is and how different it is from what, what hip hop is today. Um, this is a track by one of the legends of hip hop, a guy that is meant to be the creator of the scratch, a guy called Grand Wizard Theodore, and the um, Fantastic Five, I think, or the Fabulous Five. I'm probably completely wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, the track's called um, Can I Get a Soul Clap, and it came out in 1980. Do you want to hear it? Yeah! I said Disco rap. Yes. <laughs> And what, what came after? It's changed a lot, right? It changed a bit, yeah. So, and what came afterwards for you? I mean, there's still a quite, quite a long way to go to Quiet Village. Yeah, and um, kind of lots of stuff in between, really. Um, that's quite a deep question. Um, what happened in between? Um, uh, pff, well, that album, ca um, that was, I suppose, the first time that Matt and I ever worked together. Before that, he, and that kind of came during a period where um, he was already making music in, in uh, South London, because um, he's slightly older than me. We actually went to the same school. Uh, a private or a public school? Whatever. <laughs> same thing. He, he actually hated my school. He actually hated our school. I think he was a, we were, we were problem kids in different ways. I think he really re rebelled against it. Uh, he was quite a confrontational. So I, I don't know. I don't you, mean you made little holes in your blazers? Or how did no, you I, don't, I don't think he used to wear a blazer. <laughs> I didn't actually know him at school. But anyway, um, Matt, Matt was, wor Matt, you know, was obviously, a, as everyone knows, he was a, also a huge fan of music, comes from a different background than I do. Uh, he obviously came through the electro hip hop route and was into, we ended up going to lots of uh, similar clubs in London, uh, but obviously not knowing each other um, and it being exposed to the same kind of stuff, but without knowing. And um, he was working with another couple of guys in a studio, as I said, in South London, making a mixture of, he was very into um, kind of wild pitch music, kind of house mu music, music by, you know, certain Chicago producers like DJ Pierre and people like that, and Roy Davis Jr., who everyone I'm sure knows. And um, he also was very into um, kind of Balearic music, which we both were, so. Um, so the, the Balearic is another? Uh, smelly term, right? Yeah. Well, it never was, but it's been c another term that's been completely bastardized. But so maybe we'll come back to that later. Does everyone know in here what Balearic music is? No? Yeah? No. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose Balearic music, um, and we'll have to be very quick about this, but Balearic music traditionally was music that was um, discovered to be played in the Balearic Islands, i.e. Ibiza. Um, and it was kind of uh, championed by, it, well, it was never called Balearic music. That was a term that the English guys that went over there who became, you know, who fell in love with it, um, uh, termed it and brought it back to London and created their own scene. Uh, or originally, it was like, uh, you know, DJs in Ibiza like Alfredo and uh, Jose, who used to play, who was the original DJ at the Cafe Del Mar. And he used to play very chill out, down tempo music. And Alfredo used to play pop records and house records and lots of different stuff in between. And Balearic, I suppose, means just anything goes really, just with that kind of Mediterranean summer attitude. So, but it's, it's, it's changed and it's become a specific sound, I, I, I suspect. It's become something that's, I suppose, synonymous with down tempo music, mid tempo, you know, music that's no f no faster than like 110 bpm quite hypnotic uh so you know quite white sounding so um that's what it's kind of become anyway uh i used to hang out with matt in the studio during the latter latter part of him of, uh, you know of him working and i would you know play him all of these records i had in my collection and he was pretty inspired and a lot of the stuff I was playing him was library music. And library music is basically music that was manufactured. Does anyone know what library music here is? No? You do? Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's basically music that is manufactured by small companies, independent of the regular music business, 
just for the use in TV, advertising, radio, and, and films. And it's a cheap option, basically. That's how it started out. If you can't afford a, comp like a famous composer, or oh, you can't afford a big orchestra, there's music that's already been manufactured for your use. Uh, some of it's sound-alike stuff, some of it is composed for you, but um, it's basically a cheap option. And um, I, these records were never available for, for, you know, for, for sale in the public sector. So you used to be able to find these records in thrift stores, in car boot sales, you used to be able to find them in, uh, people used to throw them out and they'd, they'd put them in skips, you'd find them outside offices. Um, you know, sometimes you could raid old studios and they'd have them. And a lot of the music was absolutely awful. And some of it was incredibly inspiring. Everything from avant-garde jazz to electronics to like proto house to funk, African, you, you name it. Library music contains every, you know, reggae, every genre. And some of it is incredible. Some of, you know, especially during the 60s and 70s, Lots, many, many famous musicians uh, who um, who maybe had a spare spare time and wanted some extra money would do session work, and they are on some library records, but without their, you know, so an anonymously. Uh, Jimmy Page, who's like you know the legendary guitar player in Led Zeppelin, is one example. Uh, so I would play all these records. I amassed this big collection in in the mid 90s, and I would take them round, you know, just pick up 20 at a time, take them around to Matt and play them to him in the studio and he'd normally kind of freak out. And we put together about five dats of music in, you know, and we were thinking of putting out a series of compilations. This was just before we put out the rap compilation. And in the end, we didn't do anything with it, but it was kind of the beginning of uh, what, you know, of us starting to think about, you know, what we were into and ideas and label ideas. And I suppose it was the genesis of what, of what became Quiet Village. So, um, so before we hear what became Quiet Village, maybe you can play us one of those horrible library tunes. Okay, uh, no, I'm trying to think. Uh, there are so many interesting ones. Okay. What can I play you? Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to play one. Of, uh, I'm probably going to play a few because they're generally quite short. But just to show you how... Uh, ad advanced and twisted some of these records can be. Um, this is a pretty good example. This, this is on a label from the early 70s called Peer International, which, and they're, they're pretty hard to find. And the album is called Reggae For Real, but there's no reggae on it at all, uh, as, as you'll hear. Well, there are a couple of reggae tracks, but the track I'm going to play you, I, why it ended up on this record, I have no idea. I think it might have been sampled as well, so if there are any spotters out there, you might be able to tell me. So that's library music. <laughs> so have you ever seen something on TV that actually used that piece? Um, unfortunately, no, but I'm sure there's probably, in, in England we used to have these programs, schools programs, and you'd normally get, like, you know, taken into your local, you know, in, in, into the gym in your school, and the, TV, the one TV in the school would be wheeled out, and, you know, you'd sit and wait for this program to come on, generally, you know, about nature or wildlife or something like that. And um, this kind of music, not always as severe as that would normally be kind of, you know, preceding it. So um, maybe I can play another example. Of course. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, oh, I don't need the CD first. So some of you might be familiar with a producer called uh, JD, like a prolific hip-hop producer. Uh, I th if I'm correct, track three on this should be uh, one of his best, which is um, called Fuck the Police. 
And um, I'm going to play you some of this, and then I'm going to play you what he sampled, which is a library record. The views expressed on this record. Now we're going to um, we're going to play you what was the hook for that record, which is by a French library composer called Roger Roger that came out on, a, on an album from like 19. Is that funny? <laughs> Roger, Roger. Uh, he liked a Roger, apparently. And this is probably from about 1973, and it came out on uh, an English library label called Chapel, and they had a deal with a French company, and uh, I think they licensed some music, and Roger, Roger was one of the key composers. He did a lot of electronic music, and um, this is uh, probably one of his finest, and... Uh, Bootleg, maybe. Okay. I I don't know, but um, I'm not going to say I was the first person to discover this record, but I think I was. I don't know how JD got it. <laughs> I think I got it from BBC Elstree when they were clearing loads of boxes of records. <laughs> but yeah, pretty good. And I got rid of a copy very cheaply, and I didn't really. Know it was Sorry. Roger, Roger. <laughs> but how did you discover these things like library music? I mean, in what, you told in what that, way? They, that they were not really sold. So w do you remember the first time you stumbled across? Yeah, I'd, uh, what happened during the... Um, one of the things that became quite a funny pursuit during the mid-1990s, uh, which was a bit of a funny period for, for music, especially in, in, in kind of England... Why? Well, you, you know, you'd had all this great house music that came out of the late 80s and early 90s, which then became very watered down. Um, and then kind of, you know, suddenly, you know, if I was always someone that was looking for something a lot more underground. And then certain DJs that I was into at the time, like Andy, Andy Weatherall, were playing just going completely the other way and going against the grain and playing techno. And it shocked a lot of people and it freaked people out. So we used to, you know, we used to go out to clubs like Sabre Sonic and listen to him playing this stuff. And also at the same time, I was, I was spending a lot of time at a shop called Fat Cat, which again has gone, which was in Covent Garden in England. And they were the purveyors of a lot of this great European and American uh, techno. And also they sold bits of hip hop and the, all the kind of the early ambient scene, um, which maybe we'll, we'll come to, uh, which was very inspiring for someone like me, um, people like Global Communications. One of my heroes. <laughs> and um, so I was buying all these things, and at the same time, I didn't really have much money, and I started going to, you know, back into thrift stores and looking for, f you know, easy listening records that might have a funky track on it, which lots of them did. And it became a bit, a bit of a scene, and a friend of mine, he wasn't a friend at the time, but someone I got introduced to afterwards, Martin Green, had a club called Smashing, I think, and they used to play kind of, you know, famous TV themes and funky easy listening records, and he put out this compilation, which is kind of, in, in my mind, the first and best kind of groovy, easy listening compilation. It's called The Sound Gallery. It's long deleted. But on this compilation, you had all these great kind of, you know, uh, orchestras making funk tracks and, you know, funny men in suits, you know, completely ungroovy people making, you know, like Afro rock records. But amongst the tracks, you had things, you know, and, and I was trying to work out what labels they were on and all of them, all of them said EMI or whatever. And a lot of them said KPM and I was like, I've never heard of KPM, what's that? And it, I kind of found out that it was a library record label. It's this one here, which is owned by EMI, which the compilation came out on. They all have these generic sleeves, but on the back, you know, they kind of give descriptions of the tracks. I've forgotten where we were going here. Um, library music. Oh, yeah, li library music. So um, I, I, from this compilation, I discovered what this was, and then I eventually found one and put two and two together. After that... I worked out that there were no shops that you could buy this music in. So I literally kind of thought to myself, you know, who's going to have these things? 
and because they would rarely end up in shops. And I phoned up TV, I phoned up all, every television studio and every studio and every hospital radio and I phoned up everyone and I managed to get quite a lot of big record collections of, of library music from people, either for nothing or for a little bit of money because they didn't realise what they had. And I had amassed all these records and these were the things that I took around to Matt's studio to play and bit by bit I would go and play them, hence the fact that you got to find records like that, that's that track that JD sampled. And, you know, obviously you'd have to go through a lot of records, a lot of rubbish ones to find jewels in the dust or whatever, you know. So um, that's, that's what I meant with obsession early on. Yes. Uh, calling up all these people. Um, it was, a, yeah, it was a... You wanted to play us a thing of that KPM. Yeah, uh, there's a, this, is, this just shows you how, you know, uh, oddball this whole library thing is. Um, on this record, which is entitled The Sound of Pop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this, this album mirrors the music of the younger generation. The music is both instrumental and vocal, the lyrics being descriptive of the activities and opinions of the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's from 1967, and there's a track on it called LSD, <laughs> which is uh, described as being bizarre improvisation pertaining to psychedelic drug hallucinations. So I think you need to hear this one. It's not a bad trip for anyone. <laughs> this, weirdly enough, ended up on uh, an episode of uh, the, the, the original Spider-Man cartoon, in the, the late 60s animation one. Um, so, yeah, uh, it just shows you where, it, you know, where this music ended up. And, um, yeah, as, as I was saying, this stuff would have been literally composed and performed by really old-fashioned, staid English guys, probably wearing shirts and ties. You know, we know, and they would have been told what they were performing, and you know they wouldn't have had a clue about it, and they would have just done whatever they thought, you know. But LSD is just such an odd record to end up. But yeah, most most libraries did did tracks like this, but this is most definitely one of the oddest. Anyway, here we go. Those and you know television stations. <laughs> oh, sorry. There you go. Um, so, like, how, di how did, I'm just curious, like, how did the, the um, copyright around this work? Like, was it kind of like, I don't know, would you say it was like the producer loops that you can get today that are, like, copyright-free, you can use them in your music? And obviously, I know a lot of, like, TV and film studios use, like, prefabricated loops as well um, to do their scores. So, um, I, I, I don't understand exactly how, like, the commercial part worked for these companies. Basic. I'm not quite sure what, what you mean, but... Like, how did they sell them to the... To okay, the right. Because they, they weren't available in shops, okay, right? Maybe, okay, maybe I haven't explained myself. The, the deal with library companies is this. They put up the money and fund everything. They pay the session musicians the going rate, and they manufacture them. Back in... Originally, they used to sell the music by foot. Back in the really old companies. Uh, you know, the company that I actually work for, and we'll come to this in a minute, um, started in 1908. They're called DeWolf Music. And before, uh, you know, when people were making films, they'd say, I need, you know, 200 feet of action music. And they'd literally, you know, put it on a spool and they'd reel out 200 feet of action music. And then it turned into, uh, they, were, they were pressed on 78s, then on records and CDs, and now everything's digital. Um, but... Uh, they send out the records for free. So if you're a TV studio and you, and you sign up to this company, you get all the music for free. If you want to license it, then you have to pay them. And you pay the musicians union and you pay the company. Uh, but it works out far cheaper. As I said before, it's a cheap option. It works out far cheaper. Maybe you'll pay 300 pounds per track rather than 3,000 or 30,000 for a track. You know, It depends on your budget. But that's what it's there for. Um, so yeah, you end up getting sent all this stuff for free if you're a legitimate company, yeah. All right. And I now you get an access code for a digital website where you can download everything, so. You've played in Stockholm, right? Yes, I did. You have. Quite did you go record ago. shopping? Uh, yeah, I did. 
Okay, did you go to, um, it's called Nostalgie Palazzet, Nostalgic Palace. It's pretty hidden away. Oh, I know, I think I know the one you mean. My, I think my friend took me, uh, did, has it got a big, is the guy a bit of a freak? Yeah. He has to look up every record's price. Well, Sweat, sweating. And yeah, but that's like most record store owners yeah, yeah, that I know. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, but I, I don't know, it's, you should check it out anyway, because I know it's a gold mine for like this kind of music and sound effects and vinyl and all kind of stuff. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So the ball. Okay, so I've lost my thread again. Um, right, so around this time again, um, I was working as an assistant film editor um, for, uh, I worked on quite a few films and some not very well known, some quite well known like The Beach. And uh, with the Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes. Yes. And so that's what you actually wanted to become, right, in the first place. My uh, when I left school, I wanted to be in the film industry. Uh, my my two kind of passions were film and music, and I, for some weird reason, I never considered music to be a viable profession. I always thought it was kind of less worthy. Don't ask me why. It was always my hobby, and I wanted to get into films, but I didn't know as what. And I ended up working on a film as a runner and, you know, on my travels I got to walk past the editing suite and I kind of ended up falling in love with it. it was th this was back when everything was being done by, by hand. It was, you know, a proper craft. You know, you handled the film yourself. It wasn't just clicking on a mouse, which is kind of what it became. And, you know, I kind of fell in love with, like, the smell of the numbering machine and wearing the white glove. This is not a, you know, a sadistic thing. This is just, uh, you know, or maybe it is. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I got friendly with, with, with the film editor and uh, I went to go and work for an editing house, which, is like a, which was a big uh, kind of warehouse space. And in every room you had editors working on their own film. And my job was to just, you know, clear out the bins and get them tea and coffee and stuff like that. But on my travels, that's kind of how you got to meet people. And after about six months, I ended up getting offered a job with an editor, which wasn't the best experience uh, because I had a clash of personalities with, I was the second assistant and the first assistant kind of didn't really get on with me. Um, but that's another story. Um, but how can someone that get not get on with you? I, I think she had personal problems. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but, you know, so um, I went to work on this film and then I kind of ended up getting a few more jobs after that. But it was very, very difficult to get work. So many people looking for the same jobs. And then when everything went um, online, you needed less people because you had a computer. You didn't need a first assistant, second assistant, understudy. So everything changed. And... I, at this stage, because, you know, I left school in 1993 and we weren't part of the computer generation and we just kind of missed it and I hated computers in, in a big way and I felt very upset that it all changed and if I maybe would have been slightly more mature at the age I was, which was 18 or whatever, uh, and would have thought things through, I, maybe I would have thought to myself that no one else knew how this equipment works and it was all brand new and if I studied it I'd get on very quickly but I didn't and I got very bitter and frustrated and I thought that my my chosen career path had been kind of stolen away from me and I still clung on to this profession and I tried to get because it was obviously the tail end you still needed needed to go back and work on film at, at some point in the um, process if you're going to show it at the cinema now most films are shown a, a screen digitally but, you know, up until quite recently, you still need to screen it on a film print. Anyway, um, I ended up getting a job when the film work ran out for, for an, adver for an uh, a TV, um, for, for an uh, advertising uh, editing company, and they edited TV commercials. And while working for them, and this was at the same period where I discovered but the, oh, where I was listening to the easy listening and all the other rubbish, um, they had a small collection of these library records and one of the first ones that I saw was by a company called DeWolf Music and I basically, you know, phoned them up on the blag, so to speak, hoping to get some records from them and I kind of, you know, made this story up that we needed some music that, you know, had to be quite kind of, you know, black exploitation, cop show-ish and, um, you know, they were very friendly 
invited me in, and they gave me a few records, and some of which I brought with me. How uh, many feet? <laughs> they didn't. Get, no, they gave me records, um, and I struck up a very good friendship with them. And I've known them for over ten years, and I now actually work for them, and I'm in charge of putting together their back catalogue, all this old weird stuff that was never released to the general public. So that's kind of my one of my jobs. Um, at the time, when I went in and discovered that they had this great library and it was untouched, that's basically what I told the boss, who kind of simply replied, yes, I know it's a gold mine. And I got in touch with a label called, or I was approached by a label called BBE, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with, Barely Breaking Even. They've done lots of great compilations and artist albums. They did an album with JD. They've done albums with lots of Pete Rock. They've done soul, funk, disco, house compilations with most of the big producers. And this was back in their early days. And Pete from BBE got in touch with me and said, there's a friend of mine, Mark B, who I'd like to do this library compilation with. And that's when I was in introduced to Mark. And we struck up a friendship very quickly. And we both went into their archive. We went through some records and we ended up releasing with BBE this record called Bite Hard, which did very well, did very well and ended up being sampled by ev you know, everyone from Jay-Z to Fat Joe, everyone, literally. And every track ended up once. I remember seeing like a, a, a motor racing documentary on James Hunt and every track was on that. So it's been really well you know, received. And that was back in 1997, I think. And I'm just, uh, we're just about to release volume two in January. So I've known them for, you know, it's been like 10th year, but it's their centenary next year. And uh, there's lots of really amazing stuff in their archive to come out, whether it be film soundtracks that never were issued or interesting jazz or just odd, oddball music. You know, the music from Monty Python's Flying Circus, all that stuff is owned by them. The music from Dawn of the Dead, you know, the zombie film. That's all DeWolf, so. You, you also had something to do with Dawn of the Dead quite recently, right? Yeah, a, a few years ago, uh, one of my kind of ideas was to, um, when I was going through all this music at DeWolf, I came across some of the music that I uh, um, recognized from the Romero film Dawn of the Dead, which I was a big fan of. And Ev I Everyone knows that one, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's the one, yeah. <laughs> Give you that a bit louder. <laughs> And I, what was that? And I had the soundtrack, which I loved, and it was uh, composed by an Italian like progressive rock group called Goblin. And I always wondered where the rest of the music was, because the, the film is just loaded with music, absolutely crammed, like 70 bits of music in there. So I didn't know where it was. And when I went to, to go through all this music at DeWolf, the LPs, I suddenly recognized one of these tracks, and I couldn't believe it. So. I always rem remembered, and it was this kind of pet project of mine, to go through all the records and work out what all the cues were. And I eventually did, and released an album on a friend's label in a few years back, maybe 2005. And it was Dawn of the Dead, the, un the unreleased music. And um, we're going to do another follow-up, because we only put out a few tracks. And there are some more key tracks waiting to come out for real hardcore zombie fans. But, um, so yeah. shall we hear one of the scary pieces? Yeah, there's a, yeah. let's, um, if I can find it. This actually sounds like Goblin. I actually thought it was Goblin when I heard it. Um, so it's, it was quite surprising to find out that it's by a, an English composer called Simon Park. It's called Motives One. There is a Motives Two. They're both quite similar. <laughs> So which, which the scene of Dawn of the Dead is this actually from? That's actually, I think, f I'm pretty sure it's from like some weird Italian-only cut. It's not on the regular one, so I can't pinpoint it, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> and and um, before we join the dots now with Quiet Village, you, you said there's another um, influential piece for the work you did, like Quiet Village, which is more of a house track. Well, yeah, there, there are quite a few, actually. Maybe we can play 
couple of them. Um, maybe uh, what would be good? You're quite, you're okay. quite good, um, not me. Okay. Yeah, let's let's play um, a track. Hmm, I'm only wondering what order we should do this in. Uh, okay. Yeah. Why not? Okay. So. Um, yeah, I was a, Matt and I were, were both big fans of uh, the kind of New York, New Jersey uh, house sound from, you know, the late 80s and early 90s. In particular, um, a small label called New Groove. Um, and there were some truly incredible and, and talented producers on that label. Um, people like Joey Beltram and Reggie and Ronald Burrell. Um, Bobby Condors and uh, Bobby Condors made some really inspiring records, very dub based house music, quite lo fi sounding. And he worked with a keyboard player called Peter Dow, who's incredibly talented. And these, yeah, I mean, these, these people are kind of ancient history. They kind of, I'm not really sure if they make music. Well, Bobby Condors went on to make, uh, have a very successful label, uh, you know, putting out. Dancehall or yeah, Raga, yeah. He's he's running a label called Massive B. You've interviewed him, yeah? Yeah, a few years ago, and he's still m he's making I don't know if you call that bashment or dance hall or yeah. whatever. Yeah, he's basically making reggae and doing quite well, and has like a Sunday radio show on um, Hot ninety seven in New York, I believe. Okay, yeah. but his his music was so inspiring to you know me and Matt and friends of mine just because it was just came from a different kind of place in time. It wasn't conventional club music. It was, you know, very spacey, very spiritual, edgy, uh, proper, you know, nighttime music, or as you said the other days, you can play it in the early hours kind of um, style. So, um, and again, he obviously brought the love of reggae to it, very heavily influenced with uh, dub. And um, so, and so this, is a, this is one of the best tracks I think that he ever produced, and it came out one of the early releases on the label Massive B, and it's him under the name Dub Poets. It's called Black and White. Probably from 1991 or 92, early 92. Went to an old black school with an old black. It goes on for about another 10 minutes. But um, we want to cram in as much as we can. But yeah. Yeah, mu music from a different age, really. It was, that music wasn't commercial at all. It was very underground. Not many DJs played it. Um, you know, American guys like Tony Humphreys, I don't know if you're aware of these people, you, you used to play that kind of stuff. Um, but it was very, very, um, you know, um, it, it wasn't particularly stuff that was played on the radio. You know, they were small little labels that released these types of ambient house records and they were, um, it was a special time for that kind of music. And um, yeah. So was there a place in London where you could actually hear this? Not really, no, not at all. Maybe at the ministry sometimes. I was too young to get in. <laughs> Over 21s only. It was 21, yeah. And um, yeah, you said this this is pretty influential for for Quiet Village. So yeah, very maybe, much. Maybe we should um, play something from okay. Quiet Village. Yeah. In a second, but before you could maybe talk about um, yeah what how it appeared first. It was on a label uh, called Whatever We Want, also from New York. Yeah. Well, what happened was Matt and I. You know, Matt Matt was making music as Radio Slave with a guy, uh, you know, with another guy, and uh, they kind of ended their relationship. Uh, they ended their music making relationship for whatever reason. And I had never considered making music with Matt. I'd, I'd, you know, tinkered about with producing with one or two other people. And, you know, it had been fun in parts, but, you know, uh, if you don't particularly, if you, you know, it can be quite um, stressful in a studio and working in a small space with someone. Uh, you need to be of a certain temperament. So um, I, I kind of been, had been, um, felt that I needed to work with someone who, you know, it was quite an easy, you know, mellow experience. And I suppose I didn't really want to bother Matt. You know, he was, you know, kind of working quite a lot and getting getting a, getting a good name for himself. And I suppose I was more of a, 
you know, a, a kind of music fan, really. And eventually, through wanting to do these compilations, we, we started this little label called Consume Music, and we put out a few... We, we, we literally just, just made a few CDs, mix CDs, to give to friends. And out of that, one day we were, we were sitting in the studio, and I'd come across a few records that I thought might be fun to sample. And he had some free time in the studio, and we decided to you know, tr try and work together. And it was a really pleasurable experience. And we kind of continued. And the first record that we did, we took to a friend of ours uh, in New York who just started a record label called Whatever We Want Records, which was primarily an output for um, DJ Harvey's project called Map of Africa. I don't know if any of you know who DJ Harvey is, probably. And I played it to my, my friend with no intention of him you know, saying that, you know, of, of, of him putting the record out. And after about five seconds, he said, I'm going to release this record. And I kind of said, no, you're joking. You don't have to say that. No, I'm putting this record out. What else have you got? So, you know, we were pretty touched. And we ended up releasing three records with him on the label. There's like this, he had this idea of a trilogy. Um, and the first record that we did was, um, had a track on it called Pillow Talk. And maybe we should play that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. He knows. <laughs> Mr. Joel Martin, thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you. Here. Thanks very much.